President say in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome again tonight to our board meeting here on the 7th of December. We have some uh, special, well, I'm sorry, first roll call, uh, Joyce. Mr. Appleton? Here. Mr. Steele? Here. Mr. Feldman? Here. Mr. Major? Here. Mr. Morgan? Here. Dr. Scalzi? Here. Mr. Jacobs? Here. 3.0 Dr. 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 special recognitions. Tonight, the Board of Education is pleased to recognize many of our, uh, those that keep things safe for us, our SROs, our, our school resource officers. We appreciate their commitment to safety uh, and the security of our Parkway students and staff. And they are often called upon to, to do that, but they're also uh, great mentors and teachers of our students. And many of our students come to look to them for much more than just that. As a token of our appreciation, the SROs will receive special thank you notes from uh, second grade students at Barrett's Elementary. And uh, I would like to just read a few comments from some of these second grade students that I think you might enjoy. One of the notes said, thank you for helping us. You are so nice for protecting us. You are amazing. You are the best police. You are amazing and cool. Thank you so much. A second note said, thank you for keeping us safe. Do you ever give any tours around the police station? <laughs> Maybe you don't want a tour. <laughs> when do you get up in the morning for work? <laughs> a third note said, thank you for watching over us and keeping our state a safe place. A fourth note was very simple, just said, thank you, cops. <laughs> And a fifth note said, thank you for helping us at our school. I'm glad to see you at Barrett's. I have not forgot the clues of being safe. Thank you, be safe. In addition, this evening we will be honoring some teachers who have received their national board certifications. Amy Gregory at, at uh, Belle Reve, Shannon Harmon from Barrett's, and Debbie Banishek twist at North High. One of those won't be able to be with here tonight, had a prior engagement. But first, I'd like to call on Fred Crawford, if he could come forward. He's our Parkway Chief of Security, and if he would introduce the resource officers who will be honored here tonight. Thank you, Fred. Well, good evening, President Jacob and members of the board and Dr. Marty. And it truly is a special night for us to recognize our school resource officers. The Parkway School District has always made school security a priority. The Board of Education and the Superintendent have always supported our efforts in keeping kids safe, staff, parents, and the community, Parkway community safe. <clears throat> Tonight we're here to recognize our school resource officers who not only provide security to our schools, but interact with and instruct our students and serve as a resource to our principals. We are fortunate to have these men and women of law enforcement serve our district. So with that said, I ask the following officers to please come forward and be recognized as I announce your name. From the Town and Country Police Department and serving Mason Ridge Elementary, Officer Christopher Hunt and Officer Kent Berry, who's necessarily absent tonight. And in addition, and in the audience, is uh, uh, Officer Hunt's uh, commander, Captain Patrick Kranz. <laughs> From the St. Louis County Police Department and serving Fern Ridge High School, the ISC and ADC buildings, Officer Michelle Menini. from the St. Louis County Police Department and serving North High School, Officer Ezra White. <laughs> 
from the St. Louis County Police Department in serving the South Elementary Schools of Carmen Trails, Sorrento Springs, Oak Brook, and Piermont, Officer Keita Pullen. from the St. Louis County Police Department in serving the North Elementary Schools of Craig, Ross, McKelvey, and the ISC Building, Officer Dave Steinmeier. from the St. Louis County Police Department and serving South Middle School, Officer James Grotha. In addition, and in our audience, are Captain Kurt Frizz, the Central Precinct Commander, and Sergeant Tracy Panis, Precinct Supervisor, and Captain Chuck Boschert of the West County Precinct, and Sergeant Gary Sedoma, a precinct supervisor. <laughs> From the Manchester Police Department and serving South High School, Officer Evan Waters. From the Manchester Police Department and serving Southwest Middle and the elementary schools of Barrett's, Hannah Woods, and Wren Hollow is Officer Gerard Gonzalez, who's necessarily absent tonight. <laughs> From the Chesterfield Police Department and serving Central High School and Green Trails Elementary, Officer Robert Evans. From the Chesterfield Police Department and serving Central Middle, River Bend, and Shenandoah Valley Elementary, Officer Don Schlemmer. From the Chesterfield Police Department and serving West High School and the Early Childhood Center, Officer Scott Scoggins. From the Chesterfield Police Department and serving West Middle and Highcroft Ridge Elementary, Officer Matt Poussin. And in addition, and in our audience, are their supervisors, Lieutenant David Ray and Sergeant David Weiss. <laughs> From the Creep Corps Police Department and serving Northeast Middle and Bell Reeve Elementary, Officer Edward Davis. From the Baldwin Police Department and serving the Claymont and Henry Elementary Schools are Officer Sarah Bonsi and Officer Dan Hawk, who's necessarily absent tonight. <laughs> and in recognition but on assignment from the Maryland Heights Police Department is and serving McKelvey Elementary is Officer Robert Heidert.
That's certainly an impressive uh, group of men and women who give up their time and service to, to our kids to help us maintain safety in our schools. And I know most of the time they enjoy it a great deal. There are times when, when we really do need the expertise that they have, and we appreciate it so much. Um, we will continue with further uh, recognitions, and uh, I'd like to ask Kathy Blackmore if she would come to the podium, please. She's our assistant superintendent for teaching, learning, and accountability, and we appreciate all that she does. President Jacob, Vice President Feldman, Directors, Dr. Marty, Ms. Peasold. It is my honor to present to you Parkway's new National Board Certified Teachers. It seems like just yesterday that I stood before you and it introduced our first National Board teacher, Mary Jo Kahunsky, chemistry teacher from Central High. Mary Jo then began supporting our candidates. When Mary Jo retired, I ask National Board candidate Brandon Jamison, who is now a science teacher at South High, to support our candidates. Brandon, would you come forward at this time? And I remember, not too long ago, sitting with you, waiting on the phone call. Yeah. So congratulations to you too. Uh, I know you joined me in thanking Brandon for her support of Parkway teachers as they embark on this very rigorous process. National Board Certification is an advanced teaching credential. Like board certified doctors and accountants, teachers who achieve National Board Certification have met very rigorous standards through intensive study, expert evaluation, self-assessment, and peer review. The candidates complete 10 assessments that are reviewed by trained teachers in their certified areas. The assessments include four portfolio entries that feature teacher practice and six constructed response exercises that assess content knowledge. In a congressionally mandated study, National Board Certification was recently recognized by the National Research Council as having a positive impact on student achievement, teacher retention, and professional development. Our first National Board Certified Teacher is Amy Gregory from Bell Reeve Elementary. Amy, would you join us? And as I introduce Amy to you, Amy, I want you to turn around and face this group, but I'd also like Amy's support group to stand up. Her daughter, her principal, teachers, would you stand up, please, while I introduce Amy to everybody? You're part of this, too. Amy is a Bell Reeve Elementary music teacher. She is Parkway's first music teacher to be nationally board certified. Music certification has been difficult to achieve. Her principal, Jamie DeBosch, shares Amy is a gifted music teacher. She is a master at helping children appreciate very types of music throughout our community. Amy is always learning and looking for ways to improve. Each week, she gives of her planned time to work with children with special needs. The performances she creates are dynamic and multidimensional and involve handwritten scripts, singing, musical instruments, dance, and drama. She provides students with leadership opportunities both in music and in public speaking. Amy is a humble individual who is highly respected by all staff members and works collaboratively to meet students' needs. May I present Amy Gregory, National Board Certified Teacher, Music, Early and Middle Childhood. Debbie Banaschek Twist is unable to be with us tonight, but I would like her principal, Jenny Markwart, to come forward. <laughs> a little bit about Debbie. Debbie is a North High communication arts teacher. She is Parkway's first high school communication arts teacher to achieve national board certification. Her principal, Jenny Markwart, shares. Debbie is a creative, passionate teacher who inspires her students to read and write every day. 
She is an amazing mentor who willingly shares her expertise and enjoys learning for her co with her colleagues. We are lucky to have her as a teacher at North High. Debbie Banishek Twist, National Board Certified Teacher, English Language Arts, Adolescents, and Young Adulthood. And thank you for accepting in her name. We appreciate it, Jenny. <laughs> Shannon Harmon. Would you, uh, <laughs> and would her support team from Barrett's Elementary please stand? Would you stand? And Mary Black, stand. It's her surrogate mother, husband. Please stand. <laughs> Shannon, a Barrett's Elementary fifth grade teacher, recently came to Parkway from Charlotte, North Carolina as an experienced teacher. Her principal, Dr. Kelly Morton, shares, Shannon has been a tremendous addition to Parkway. Her classroom is one with a strong and positive community where students think deeply and reflect on their learning. Being newly hired in July, Shannon quickly established rapport with her students, parents, and the staff at Barrett's, obviously. She is a quality instructor that always focuses on what is best for her students. Shannon has many talents to share, and we are so pleased she is part of Barrett's Elementary School. May I present Shannon Harmon, National Board Certified Teacher, Middle Childhood Generalist. Congratulations. <laughs> really appreciate these uh, fine teachers for what they have accomplished. It's a, a lot of effort and uh, I know it's a big burden that's been lifted off of them and uh, they'll certainly be wonderful teachers, even better. There is one other uh, recognition that I'd like to, to uh, go ahead and do this evening. Uh, we have a special person who has distinguished themselves. Uh, this person has been with us a long time. She actually uh, taught my daughter in the fifth grade and taught uh, board member Bruce Major's uh, daughter in middle school. I'm talking about our Parkway NEA president, uh, Joanda <laughs> Bozeman. <laughs> Recently, uh, uh, myself and uh, Board member Bruce Major, we had the opportunity to go to one of their annual meetings where she was recognized. Uh, let me just read what, what it says here about this award that she received. Uh, Joanda Bozeman, Parkway National Education Association President, has been recognized for her leadership and integrity. Ms. Bozeman received the Shirley Cromer Leadership Award from the Missouri National Education Association on November 12th in St. Louis. Each year this award is presented to a Missouri NEA member who demonstrates outstanding leadership and exemplifies the characteristics Shirley Cromer valued. Shirley Cromer, a former MNEA president, believed that true leadership extends beyond local and state participation and includes support of national goals and programs that preserve the association's ongoing continuity and integrity. The winner of this award receives a monetary grant to attend the National Education Association's conference or the NEA Midwest Regional Leadership Conference. We congratulate you, jo Joanda, for this recognition, and, and we're, ha we're happy and proud of you. <clears throat> On behalf of the board, we thank all of our SROs for their great work, and we're, we we're so happy to recognize them. For each of these newly board certified teachers, we thank you, Fred, for your leadership too there with the school resource officers and those representatives who are here with them to help them with this. We appreciate all that you do for our students and ask that you would pass our thanks on to your departments and students and schools. 
And just before we take a short break, I did see Bill Senti out there. And for the consummate Cardinal fan, we're hopeful that his father is, uh, has his thumb on what's happening there with Mr. Pujols. Because <laughs> we know that that'll make your dad happy, and that's what we look for. Thank you. We'll take a short break. We just can't get away from it, Bill. <laughs>
We'll continue our board meeting. We're looking at uh, 4.0, additions, corrections, and modifications to the agenda. Dr. Marty, I think you have something. I do, uh, President Jacob. Uh, <coughs> we would like to add under um, uh, 10.02, the approval of personnel matters, two items. We'd like to add the addition of the approval of Mrs. Rhonda Coleman as the new principal at Highcroft uh, Ridge for the remainder of the 2011-2012 school year. And then secondly, we'd like to add the resignation at the end of this semester of Ms. Julie Harrison as the uh, coordinator of K-12 counseling in the district. Okay. Thank you very much. The next 5.0 citizen statements. And we have three statements tonight. I'll call your name and ask you to come to the podium and if you would state your name and your address so we can be sure that we get a response to you to the right place. Uh, and you will have three minutes and Beth will help me with the, uh, make sure that we stay on schedule there and we keep you informed. May I call first on uh, Mr. Melvin Clearman Uh, to, to Joyce and she'll get it to uh, the rest of us. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Melvin, I'll wait till you get it. <coughs> oh, I got enough. I'll be darned. Uh, Melvin Clearman, 739 Bergerac Drive. I'm not going to read uh, uh, President J uh, Jacob and Dr. Marty and members of the board. I'm not going to read the comments on the front page because I, I don't have all the facts, but I am concerned about it and I'd like you to look at it. And if you can, uh, let me know what the, the situation is. On the back page, I'm extremely worried about the problems in the European Union and how they will spread and affect our economy. Uh, I used, at my younger days, I used to be a commodity futures broker. I was a mediocre trader because of the high leverage, but I wasn't a bad analyst. And I used history and logarithmic charts as my tools. And uh, if, if you'll notice at the bottom of the page, I change uh, Georgia Santiana's famous quote, from those who cannot remember history are condemned to repeat it. I change it to those who ignore history are destined to repeat it. And I'm concerned that our children are not coming out with enough education about financial and monetary matter to handle the problems that they are going to be confronted with in the future. So I've recommended uh, something that you've heard me before asking about more education for financial and monetary matters. I'm so serious about it, uh, and if I may, I understand that Parkway is going to have to make some cuts because of budget restraints. Dr. Marty, uh, that's where I read, I believe. Uh, may I suggest, last year, the Collector of Revenue of St. Louis County told me that escrows from real estate taxes for mortgage that are sent to mortgage companies total $520 million. Uh, it would, it's by law, by Missouri statute, that that money gets distributed to the mortgage companies and only once a year. December, you know, from time for the final payment, do they have to give it back to the county? Uh, a week ago yesterday, I suggested to a county councilwoman that we take up this matter instead of the mortgage companies who are going to invest it and earn interest on it, that the county keep the money and distribute it to the taxing district quarterly at least. Now, I, I, don't, I know the Parkway is a big portion 
of the real estate taxes, so it's not chump change. And even at today's unbelievably minuscule T-bill rates, it's still more money that you can get and perhaps fill some void. So if, if we can get enough of the taxing districts together, maybe the law can be changed. There are some uh, interested Missouri state representatives who might put this forward. It's just a, it's just a, at least I can still got my imagination, so it, it's, it's just a suggestion. But I thank you about this. I am concerned about uh, the future of our children. And I, I want to emphasize, I hold the education that Parkway gives our children in the highest esteem. It's just that when they get out into the real world, they, they might need a little more. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clearman. And you will receive a response from us. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. I have to leave. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, next uh, citizen statement is from uh, Ms. Angela Hall Anderson. And again, if you would just state your name and your address when you come to the podium. <coughs> My name is Angela Hall Anderson. My address is 15 Archway Manor Drive, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I was coming here this evening to speak to you about um, a termination from the Transportation Department. Uh, I've been on medical leave, and Nancy Davis said I was receiving a termination because I didn't have a return to work date but I did get a return to work date from my physician. So I was coming this evening to let you know that I did have a return to work date, but I am still being seen for my problems. And that's, that's all I can let you know. All right, thank you very much. And thank we you. will respond to you in writing. All righty, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. And our third uh, citizen statement tonight, and the final one, is from uh, Lily Lieberman. And I put down Sam Goodman. Yes, and Sam Goodman. Excuse yes. me. Yes. Uh, Lily Lieberman, and I'm Sam Goodman. We live at 10463, number 4, Briar Bend, St. Louis, Missouri. I am going to be talking on Lily's behalf. So anytime I say, I'm not a professional, we, it, but, who, or I, it will be coming from her, okay? I'd like to thank the board for letting me come here tonight and talk in front of you. I did send you a letter. Lily sent you a letter, and I'm sure you guys saw it, and I hope you did the fact-finding. We wouldn't be here if we didn't think that we were correct. I asked to, be, to come in front of you in, a, in any session, and I didn't get a response. I finally got a call, and I appreciate it. Okay, Lily has been a dedicated worker here for five years. If you go to her school and talk to the teachers and children, she's known as Lily. She's a dedicated employee. She's been dealt unfairly with false accusations. And if you truth find, you will find those false accusations. Everybody that works in a school district has to have good employer-employee relations. Everybody is the same. It's our right in America with equal employment. Nobody is better than anybody else. There's self-dignity and respect that should be given to every employee and not personally point somebody out for any personal matters. I also like to thank <clears throat> Lily for being a truthful person, which she is. We wouldn't be standing here because of the job for the money. What she makes is minuscule. She does it because she was a stay-home mom for a long time with a child that we had that had some disabilities, and she's dealt with that. She's doing this for enjoyment of children. I just want to say that uh, 
<clears throat> she will tell you, and I will tell you, we won't go away. Legal action will come if these false accusations are not cleared up and a decision in her favor as specified in her letter to the board. It's not just because of the money. It is self-respect and dignity. I wonder how much self-respect and dignity and stress are worth. I don't know. Maybe you do. I just want to say, Lily and I, we go to bed at night, we close our eyes, and we're able to sleep because we are honest and truthful people. And I hope that you as the board will have that same respect and fact find and be able to sleep with your conscience and see through smoke. And lastly, I want to thank you and say to Haile, my son, I love you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Goodman and, and Lily. We thank you too. And you will receive a response in writing from the board. Thank you for your time. Six point oh call for executive session. There is none. Seven point oh approval of the agenda for December seventh, two thousand eleven. May I have a second and a motion to approve the agenda for December seventh, two thousand eleven? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries seven zero. 8.0 resolutions, there are none. 9.0 communications, uh, one thing I would like to point out is that there will be a, there are two seats uh, coming up available on the board. There will be an election in April for those two seats. Uh, those two seats currently are being occupied by Beth Feldman and Helen Castile. Uh, the board filings begin on December 13th and then the that period closes for filings of those who are interested in running on January 17th, 2012. Uh, 9.01, calendar of meetings. The next meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Wednesday, January 11th, 2012, here at Central Middle School starting at 7.30 p.m. Uh, next, 9.02, liaison reports. If uh, before I go to the board, I'd like to ask Dr. Marty, who has one item that, uh, that he would like to make the board aware of. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have been celebrating uh, the last uh, uh, week, uh, Inclusive Schools Week activities. And I just wanted to share with the board uh, that I have been around uh, several schools, and, and they've done many marvelous things to make our students aware of uh, what people can do to overcome disabilities and, and certainly we want to become more inclusive in our schools. But I want to give special note to Northeast Middle School who this last Monday had a very special activity and uh, a proclamation was read with the cooperation of uh, Mayor Harold Dealman, who's the mayor of Creve Corps, by the way, for 28 years. And he was on hand to read the proclamation to the students and I and the uh, pr uh, administration Kim Brandon and Bill Asente participated, and I was very, very impressed with um, the activity and certainly the emphasis uh, around also the work of Northeast around other uh, work in terms of building character and values. So uh, the proclamation, I'll just pass it down. Uh, you see it was read by Mayor Dillman, and we were very proud to be part of all that activity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marty. Now, are there any liaison reports from the board that you would like to Tell us about. Mr. Major? Uh, let's see, Monday night when I think uh, several other board members were uh, actively engaged uh, far later than I, <laughs> the, uh, we did have the uh, special school district uh, governing council meeting and uh, did uh, mention the uh, Parkway Early Childhood Center and the, and the teacher who was the uh, subject of a gift from uh, one of the parents or parents of one of her students from last year, uh, which has uh, resulted in uh, a new sm smart board in that classroom up at uh, early at the uh, Early Childhood Center. So certainly uh, ni nice to be able to share those stories with the other uh, districts in SSD. Thank you. Mr. Applebaum, do you have anything? Well, I, I briefly attended the government relations meeting and, uh, and learned 
way more than charter, about charter schools than I thought I'd ever know. Um, and it was very, very interesting. Um, but that's about it. Okay. Thank you. It was the same. Uh, attending the Government Relations Committee and learning the difference between charter schools and uh, public schools and, and the ins and outs of uh, um, how they're evaluated, how the people are chosen, uh, who the, who's on the boards of these charter schools. So it was a very, very informative session. Ditto. <laughs> and also Mr. Major and I today um, attended with Dr. Marty the Facilities Operations Holiday Luncheon and thank you for having us. It was really fun to see. Um, everyone should check YouTube. I think you're going to see a great performance by Mr. Mertens with the South High Choir. <laughs> yes. Could he give so us a demonstration? He might. I don't know. But thank you so much so for having nice. us. Thank you. Hi, yeah. um, I was Steve Overman, attended PTO Leadership. PTO Leadership? No, I was there. Who was it? Who was it? With Mr. Jacob, PTO Leadership, um, earlier in the week. Yeah. And we had a great word study exercise, and now we all understand how our kids are learning about words from Lisa Meredith, and we learned some, some stuff about assessments um, from Julie Collins, and it was a, a great time had by all. That group seems to be growing. and in popularity from when I was president we kind of got a few people now the room is standing room only so good job um, I want to remind Beth that I was there too <laughs> <laughs> sitting was right next to her <laughs> two, ball, two, but, ball uh, two, ball, two ball guys on a board meeting <laughs> but I, I just on behalf of everyone uh, we really appreciate the leadership of parents to uh, take on the roles of of the importance of parent uh, volunteerism in the schools and uh, the PTO presence, presidents do a great job of getting parents in the schools involved and um, engaged in what is going on in the schools, support the schools in so many ways and uh, that is so important to the total education of our students and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. I really appreciate serving with members on this board and uh, one of the activities that we have from time to time, uh, once a month we have uh, uh, disciplinary hearings and I won't get into anything there except to say that uh, you know, it isn't something we do in 15 minutes. We were there for a long time discussing things and trying to make sure we made the right decision for kids <coughs> so that they would get the right schooling, the right opportunity and uh, sometimes they're they're, they're, they're actually they are the hardest part of this job because uh, sometimes you have to make some really tough decisions and, and that wasn't uh, we only had two cases but we were there starting at 630 and we finished up around 20 after 9 because we wanted to make sure we exhausted everything uh, that we could and make a good decision and I think we did in fact I know we did so I really appreciate the, these members of the board who come out and, and just don't they don't take it lightly Thank you very much. 10.0 uh, are action consent items. Uh, are there any uh, that we need to, well I guess I'll ask for a motion in a second to approve these action consent items. So moved. Second. Are there any that there are any questions about or any that need to be pulled for discussion? Some polar active monitors. Is that why it's cold outside? <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I didn't. I, I didn't hear the question about the polar active monitors. Oh well, I, what I had requested um, um, in my email was basically the purpose, and I really never heard of these before. So I just wanted to see what they were and how they work. 
Is this going to explode or no? <laughs> and in fact, it'll help you to keep you from exploring, exploding maybe. Um, <laughs> the um, polar active monitors um, is something fairly new. Um, we are learning more and more about connections between physical activity and fitness and um, academic achievement, learning, uh, brain development, and um, certainly uh, the recommendation from the Surgeon General is to, uh, for all of our um, youth to get 60 minutes or more of physical activity per day, and that's moderate to vigorous physical activity. So um, walking casually in the hallways doesn't count. Um, in fact, if you look at the watch that I have, I, I had that on since uh, about 1 o'clock today and accumulated um, four hours of physical activity. However, only, um, I believe, 17 minutes of it was moderate to vigorous. So obviously, I didn't get my workout in today um, going from school to school. <laughs> I should have been walking a little bit faster pace. Um, but the, this tool, um, while it may be seen as a nice-to-have um, technology tool in our um, department, in our program, uh, we strongly feel that it is essential to us um, meeting our, um, well, district mission and our department goals. So we, um, this will help our students to monitor their growth towards learning targets as well as to um, self-manage their own um, physical activity levels in class. Um, we, we know from research that on average, typically, and this isn't Parkway data, but national data that in, an, in a um, typical physical education class of about um, 30 to 40 minutes, six to eight minutes of that time may be moderate to vigorous. Um, our teachers um, piloted this product last spring. We had three schools, Henry, um, Ross Elementary, and Shenandoah, and they found the, the activity levels just off the charts. In a 50-minute class, these kids were averaging 30 to 40 minutes moderate to vigorous um, with their physical activity levels. So um, the kids are super excited about it. Our teachers um, had a chance to attend a workshop this summer and to actually wear these um, this fall um, from the workshop until now. We actually had one teacher at Ross Elementary lost 28 pounds just by being aware of his physical activity levels. Um, the watch will, yeah, what's that, you want to? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, you know, the kids see it as a cool gadget. We see it as um, essential to, um, to our goals of developing healthy, fit, active kids who are ready to learn. I understand there's 400 of these that were ordered? We started with um, three sets to pilot, and we wanted to, um, because the other schools were getting jealous, we wanted to get those in the hands by one set for each of the remaining 15 elementary schools. And a set would be um, 25 active monitors, which would be shared and rotated throughout the year. Oh, uh, th that was my next question. Are these to be used, uh, are like handed down to the next grade or to... Well, the way we intend to use these... Um, we, we want to try to use them as much as we can during the, the regular PE classes, but really, ideally, what we intend to do with these is allow kids to wear the, the monitor an entire week, 24-7, and to look at sleep patterns as well as physical activity patterns. And um, we're interested in seeing um, the results of that and, and trying to identify correlations even with sleep patterns and academic achievement. So but basically what will happen um, is at the beginning of the year, they will, um, you know, we're going to start with one grade level and then as we learn to manage them, add more and more grade levels to it and see, you know, what all can be done. But um, we will have um, students do this week-long assessment at the beginning of the year and then we'll do a, a week-long assessment at the end of the year. Now, in physical education, for the longest time, we've been just looking at fitness data. Um, and there are correlations between fitness levels and academic achievement, but we know that there, there's correlations with physical activity levels as well. We don't just want to assess fitness. 
we want to assess behavioral change with regards to physical activity patterns with our students. Then we know we've done our job. And this tool here will help us do that. What, what kind of information do you get from that specifically? I mean, do you, do you keep a chart of, okay, I, I, uh, the student has done uh, maybe 30 minutes per day? I mean, how do you follow this? There's, um, there's a menu um, that you, if you press, I don't know who has the watch. <laughs> it disappeared. <laughs> Alan has it. Alan has it. Each day, um, there's a like a little, um, oh, a little graph, a little tube-looking graph, and they try to fill up the the tube with 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And once they do that, then you know, sparks fly and it, it has a little celebration. But it continues to keep track of it. But each day of the week, it will keep seven days worth of data in this watch, and then um, students can download or teachers with um, can download the information and that information can be sent home in a, um, in a graph and a report to the parents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So are they now in every elementary school? That, that would be the idea? That the idea would be to get these um, in the hands of the, of the elementary schools um, at the beginning of the school year. I'm sorry, the beginning of the new year. <laughs> I just have a quick question about your numbers. On your, on your report you say that um, you want to purchase them for 16 remaining elementary schools? It should be 15. Got it. it should be 15. I'm sorry. There's 18 elementary schools, right? Okay. That's how my <laughs> So how, how do you plan to use the data <clears throat> from all the students? And how do you collect that data and put it into a report or? Well, right now, um, we actually are collecting, we, we're um, gathering fitness data cardiovascular fitness, flexibility, core body strength, um, muscle strength, and we're uploading that data into PARS. Okay. And then, um, with the help of Joyce Scarlatelli, she has been able to correlate our fitness um, levels to MAP scores, SAT scores, and um, we're seeing some really um, in incredible um, information, positive correlations um, between those two. Um, we hope to do the same thing with physical activity and look at um, you know, what levels of physical activity will um, materialize into higher achievement for our students. Would you do that as a group uh, and individually or just as a group? Probably individually. Individually? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we'll have school data that we might look at an entire fifth grade but um, we will have the ability to break it down individually. Great. Mr. Major. No GPS capability, no small <laughs> cameras, no. Not yet, but I'm sure the technology's there. <laughs> but we don't want to send that. No, to our no, children, no, no, right? they can't track our students. They won't be able to track our students. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And thank you for being interested in what we're doing in health and PE in Parkland. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Helen. Are there any other uh, of these uh, action items that, that people have any questions about? If not, we have a motion and a second uh, all to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Mr. Being President, <coughs> I'll need to abstain from the uh, check previous item. Previously identified to the secretary under 10.03. Thank you. Joyce, if you'll note that, we appreciate that. Uh, the motion then carries, excluding that one item for Mr. Major, 7 0. Now, being the big district that we are, there are people that come and go and uh, for various reasons. And uh, in fact, I got a little, nice little letter this week from. Tim uh, Hudson uh, out there in Seattle, and he hasn't seen snow, but he's seen a lot of rain. <laughs> we could have told him that. But uh, I'd like to call on Kathy Blackmore, if I could, if she would come forward. We have a, a person who's going to take his place, and we look forward to the introduction of our new math coordinator for Parkway School District, Dr. Amy Spears. Good evening again. The mission of the Parkway School District is to ensure all students are capable 
curious, confident learners who understand and respond to the challenges of the ever-changing world. Our new math coordinator, Dr. Amy Spears, believes to achieve mission, students should not only have mathematical knowledge and skills, but they need to truly understand math so they are capable of transferring their knowledge to solve relevant problems today and in the future. Her vision is Parkway's vision. She believes in transfer. We talked in the interviews about creative, thoughtful, and effective problem solvers, and her answer is algebra is problem solving. She believes in self-directed, skilled, persistent learners. That has been a goal of hers as a teacher. Literate and critical consumers of information and ideas, and yes, that means mathematics. Articulate speakers and effective listeners of math working skillfully with others to achieve common goals. I think far too often we don't think of the problem-solving process as being collaborative in our math classrooms, and that's very important to Amy. Also pursuing a personal direction based on an understanding of talents and interests, and Amy's goal is to continue challenging, quote, the myths in math and help teachers and students get past the mental game a quote, and I think I've heard it maybe about 10 times so far, math is fun. And that's the paradigm that she wants to create. And she's working with Mr. Kirchhofer on that. Um, a little bit about Amy. Uh, she has certification in uh, grades 5, 9, math and science. Also in mathematics 9 through 12. She has taught algebra 1, 2 and created a course called algebra 3 and we're really interested in hearing about that. She has taught ACT prep courses. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in middle school math and science. Master's of Arts degree in education with certificate in character education. Her thesis was teaching probability and statistics in high school with hands-on activities. I heard from her previous principals that she is not a traditional math teacher and that she is a joy to watch. Uh, she has her doctorate in education and instructional leadership from Lindenwood University. Her title of her doctorate was in, in her dissertation, Investigating Smart Board Technology for Mathematics Education to Improve the Learning of Digital Native Students. She now is an adjunct professor at Lindenwood University with a specialist project, specialist experience, online instructor in measurement and evaluation, and methods of mathematics. She is a dissertation chair and a dissertation committee member and reviews the dissertations that come from Lindenwood University. She's also pre presented uh, quite a bit on professional learning communities. She's organized PLC instruction for our school for a year. She has already had training on the Common Core. All of her students present their units and lessons to her at Lindenwood University in the Understanding by Design format. So I think you're hearing a great deal of commonality. A few things about Amy from her references. She has many strengths. Her professional courage to do the right thing on behalf of students is at the top of the list. Her dedication to students is genuine and sincere. Amy chooses the path that best meets the course goals and student needs, not necessarily the path that is easiest or fastest to accomplish. Also, it is said she is a born leader. Her ability to bring consensus to situations is amazing. She has the ability to cause people to stretch. You have to see her in action to truly understand her passion for working with students, teachers, community members to realize their full potential. Amy, Amy officially begins in Parkway on January 3rd, but she will be here tomorrow. <laughs> she has no choice. And we are anxious to get started. To quote Amy again, this is my dream job. I believe Amy has been working most of her life to be our mathematics coordinator. And I believe Parkway is the exact right place for Amy to be. Join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Spears to Parkway. We certainly welcome you, Dr. Spears, and I just think it's uncanny that the two of you are dressed alike. <laughs> you know, one of the things I'm most proud of in my high school career was a science project that I 
uh, conducted, which was titled Processing Highly Complex Carbon Monulocus Waste Material Found Only by Processing a, a Euglena in a Retort. In other words, uh, cafeteria food. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we've improved a lot. We do welcome you and look forward to working with you in math. Uh, it was very important to us to find the right person, and we're, we're very happy about this election. 11.0 uh, action items, there are none. 12.0 reports, there are none. 13.0, a work session. Mr. Stockwell, you have some information for us, a budget work session. <coughs> I'm trying. Did you pay the bill, Mark? Apparently not. <laughs> Good evening. Tonight is the first formal step in the development of the 2012-2013 uh, school district operating budget. And uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, we've been very, very fortunate over the last couple of years and that we've essentially been able to delay a lot of the budget issues that many of our neighboring districts have been experiencing uh, you know, for two or three years. Um, we've been able to do that in, in large part because we had built up, um, you know, substantial reserves and uh, we've actually been spending those down a little bit over the last couple of years. So uh, it's actually allowed us to, again, delay some of those challenges. Um, but unfortunately, this economic downturn hasn't uh, turned around very quickly and we don't see it happening uh, in the very near future. So. Uh, we're facing some challenges now uh, that, that, again, a lot of other districts have been seeing for a couple years. One of the things I, I first want to show you is that uh, this is a schedule of our revenues over the past five years, past four years, and that we're projecting for this year. And if you look at the, the first yellow highlighted uh, number in the, uh, the first column there, it's our FY08 uh, operating revenues, and they're at $206 million. And if you look at our uh, FY12 numbers, which are the numbers in the final column to the right, you'll see that we're projecting $205 million in annual operating revenues for this year. That's about a $1.3 million uh, decline over that five-year period. So we've actually seen revenues decrease approximately 0.65% annually over the last five years. So it's a we're very fortunate that our revenues are relatively stable. However, they are lower than they were in 07-08. When you look at the expenditure side of our equation, you see that over that same time frame, our revenues have increased, I mean, not, not exorbitantly, but uh, on an average about 3% a year. Uh, and uh, basically, when you put those two together, common sense tells you that can't continue very long 
we've actually been spending down some of our excess reserves. <coughs> and uh, basically our board policy tells us that we need to maintain 17.3% of our operating expenses in cash on hand at, at the end of the fiscal year. And this year that's projected to be about a little over $36 million. And if you look at this next um, line chart, you can see the top two lines. The blue line are our revenues over the past five years. The red line is the expenses, and you can see that they intersected during the 2009-10 fiscal year. And if you look at the lower section of that uh, chart, the lavender line is the uh, board policy reserve requirements. It's pretty level across those years. If you look at the tan line, that is our, what our actual reserves uh, did over those years. And you can see that we passed Prop R in November of 06, and our reserves began climbing, and they grew to, I believe, almost 28% a couple years ago, and then we've begun spending down those excess reserves. And if, we, if the trend continues as it has the last couple years, we will actually fall uh, right at or just below our minimum reserve requirements by the end of this year. So bottom line is we, we realize we need to adjust what, what we're spending our money on or the levels of, of expenses we have. And to tackle that challenge, Dr. Marty pulled together an ad hoc budget review committee. Uh, it includes 22 administrators from uh, throughout the district. Uh, this group began meeting in October, and we've met seven times, uh, half days each time over the past couple months. And we began working with a set of principles that we were going to use to evaluate our budget. <clears throat> we started off with uh, our strategic, strategic plan, and you know we acknowledged that it's the roadmap to our budgeting and that it can't be compromised. We agreed that the best approach is a multi-year budget planning process and that continued spend down of excess reserves is not sustainable. We believe our fund balance parameters must be maintained over time. And we currently spend about 85% of our operating budget on salaries and benefits, and we believe that we need to probably move that more towards an 80-20 split, uh, and we're working towards that. We, uh, we believe staffing models need to be update, updated and established where they're not currently in place, and then we need to follow them. Uh, classroom staffing is a priority and that we cannot compromise professional development or support of our staff and finally the budget process must be transparent. We took those principles and we applied them or started reviewing all of our operations and our budget and we identified eight categories of, of expenses where we believe we may be able to find some savings or some reductions. Uh, we we do have staffing models that we've operated off of in some areas. Some areas we don't. Uh, we've been very effective in, in using those models in some areas. As, as enrollment has declined over the years, we've actually reduced a lot of staffing. But there are some categories that we haven't been as, as uh, vigilant in, in those areas, and we believe we can probably reduce some staffing um, using those models. We uh, also have departmental staffing, you know, finance, technology, transportation, facilities, uh, and we believe looking at all of those operations, we can possibly trim down some of our staffing there as well. And then we have our non-salary and benefit pieces of our school building budgets and our program budgets, and we're looking at all of those as well for opportunities to uh, maybe do some reductions. And we also believe that there are areas in our, in our uh, budget where we can, our operations, where we can actually be more efficient um, in areas of potentially travel, utilities, food purchases. Um, we're even looking at the possibility of a, some type of a centralized registration process that might allow us to be more um, efficient. <coughs> We've also added over the last few years a number of um, programs to support uh, teaching and learning in, in our schools, the support of teachers. And we're looking, trying to determine if there are opportunities for us to maybe combine some of those programs uh, and, pot and potentially be more efficient. We're looking at the number of TEAs and how they're used in all of our schools. Um, we're looking at instructional staffing. We're trying to stay away from that as much as possible. 
but we're looking at it to see if there are ways that we can be more efficient and, and adjust those uh, a little maybe to, to and without uh, any significant impact on teaching and learning. And then we're also looking for opportunities to generate some additional revenues. And a couple of the areas where we've identified uh, include uh, summer school fees and the possibility of uh, adjusting the use of premises fees that we charge people that use our buildings. So we, we, we're still working through that process. And again, we started in October. You know, we're, we're giving you a general idea of what's gone on over the last couple of months in that tonight. What we'd like to do is bring back a proposal for budget recommendations uh, at the January 11th meeting. And then we'd ask you to uh, actually give us feedback at that point, and then we would bring forward a proposal for your formal approval at the February 8th meeting. And then I would present to you a preliminary budget proposal on May 2nd, and then the formal budget uh, proposal would go before you for formal adoption in June of next year. The, the, the balance of this presentation is primarily that what we would normally refer to as our budget assumptions. These are the main uh, factors that impact our, our expenses each year. And one of the biggest factors is our enrollment. And over the past 10 to 15 years, we have seen our enrollment decline, you know, four or 5,000 kids. Um, but what we're projecting moving forward is that our enrollment is actually going to remain pretty, pretty stable and actually increase slightly. So, can we ask a question? Sure. What's a phase two student? A phase two student, uh, self-contained, a student that spends uh, more than 50% of their time in a, in a, a non-general ed classroom. Um, basically, when, we, when we, we take our enrollment and then we apply models to determine how many instructional staff members we have in the schools. And, uh, this year, we have about 1,375 teachers, uh, instructional staff members in our schools, um, spread out over the three levels. And we start at the elementary level where we use class size targets. And uh, you can see the, on the, the target column, you know, kindergarten, for example, our target is 17. If you move over a column, you see that our average class size at kindergarten is 17.6 students and our maximum class size at that level is 20. And I want to point out as well, um, our averages and our maximum are, are well below the state uh, ranges for the, those at all levels. Um, when we go to the middle school level, we actually start with a student to teacher ratio uh, of 16.71 students to each student to each teacher. And that gave us a uh, base staffing pool of 234 teachers this year. We then added 85 teachers for um, program preservation, librarian, counselor, reading and math specialist, com arts, lit coach, gifted, reading TAs, making meaning and mosaics. And uh, we ended up with 300, almost 319 teachers. And that gave us an overall student teacher ratio of 12.2. 12.24 to 1 at the middle school level. At the high school level, we again use the same 16.71 uh, to 1 student teacher ratio. Started with a base of 361 teachers and then added 82 additional staff members for uh, the Fern Ridge program, block scheduling, program preservation, uh, librarian, literacy, counselors, uh, athletic director, permanent sub, building manager. A-plus coordinator, uh, gifted um, academic TAs, and read 180. And we ended up with 444 te teachers, uh, which is a 13.6 to 1 student-teacher ratio. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we are looking at all of our um, administrative and support staffing programs, trying to identify uh, areas where we can possibly trim back some. And we are currently reviewing all of our frameworks. Uh, I've, I've listed the secretaries, custodians, maintenance, uh, pretty much every program we have, we're evaluating the frameworks and, and searching for opportunities to potentially become more efficient and maybe trim some expenses. We currently have two employee groups that have contracts uh, in place for the next two years. 
that's our teachers and our nurses. Uh, we'll be negotiating with our facilities workers uh, this year, and then uh, again, all of our other employee groups will be. You'll be determining what uh, adjustments, if any, are available to them moving forward. We uh, another large piece of our budget are, are uh, the benefits, fringe benefits, and we know that January 1, 2012, our health, dental, and vision insurance is going to increase approximately 4.9. 4.95 percent. The current market trend is 10 to 12 percent. Uh, we currently have in our projections about 5 percent for next year. So that may force us to look at additional plan design changes to, to control those costs. One uh, positive factor that actually hasn't been built into our projections yet because we just uh, received this information is that the retirement system contributions will not be increasing next year. I think you all remember they have been uh, increasing annually for the last four or five years, uh, actually potentially even more than that. So uh, that's one positive factor moving forward. Included on our program budgets, we also have funding for textbooks and instructional equipment. This year it's just under $2 million. Next year we have a major science and social studies uh, adoptions planned and those uh, unfortunately we were, were, were hoping to trim budgets this is an area where we may be forced to increase some uh, and, and we'll be bringing more uh, detailed information back to you as we move forward the schools are, are provided school operating budgets they're, gi they're given a, uh, a dollar amount per pupil that they use for their operating supplies in their buildings uh, one of the things that we have agreed to already or agreed to recommend to you is that we reduce those per pupil allocations by 10% for next year and that will save us approximately $350,000. Uh, another big piece of, in our budget uh, is uh, the purchase of buses each year. We currently operate 115 of our own buses and we manage a, a special 33 buses in our special education fleet that they're actually owned by special school district but in replacing our buses buses we're on a 10-year replacement cycle uh, we actually have bids uh, for uh, 12 new buses and the bids came in at eight hundred ten thousand dollars of which I, I believe that was on tonight's agenda if I'm not mistaken and um, we would then be ordering these that they'd be delivered next summer and um, you know, basically that's, you know, again, estimated, not estimated, it's actually $810,000. Historically, DESE used to uh, reimburse us about 75% of our transportation costs, and with the state's budget cuts, that is one area that's actually hit us probably harder than any other from the state. Um, they're now uh, reimbursing us between 20 and 25%, so uh, it's gone down dramatically. <coughs> Uh, our program budgets, non-staffing pieces of our program budgets, total approximately $29 million, and we are reviewing all of those and looking for opportunities to uh, reduce those. In our current projections for next year, we have $1.2 million included for computer replacements. Uh, the elementary staff um, are scheduled for a refresh next year. And uh, we also intend to replace uh, a fifth of the high school and middle school student machines are the major pieces of that. And uh, you know, as you're all aware, we pe the voters approved a, a bond issue in 2008. This next summer will be the fourth year of the, the implementation of, or the, the spend down of those funds. Um, we are expecting to spend approximately $15 million next summer and then the final $8 million uh, the following summer. The largest projects uh, scheduled for the summer of 2012 include the West High School Science Renovation and the Carmen Trails Interior Partitions. Um, the bond funds also, we also included some for uh, funding for technology and uh, we will be bringing forward a proposal to up, upgrade our wireless infrastructure over the next few months as well. So in, in summary, uh, you know, what we've had and what we're projecting is we've had declining revenues. We're not projecting any significant growth moving forward. We've had moderate expenditure growth. 
we've been spending down our excess reserves. Uh, so we've, we've put together an ad hoc budget review committee to, to actually evaluate our budget and, and look for opportunities to um, reduce where we can without impacting uh, dr dramatically uh, instruction in the schools. And this committee will be coming forward with recommendations uh, to uh, reduce our operating budget by three to five percent, which you know doesn't sound like a great deal, but on our, the size of our budget, it is seven to nine million dollars annually. So, um, and just to remind you, we will be coming back next meeting uh, with a recommendation for those reductions, and then we'll ask you, or hope you'll be in a position to. Uh, act on those that recommendation at the February 8th meeting. Uh, again, the budget workshop, preliminary budget workshop, is scheduled for May 2nd, and then the formal budget adoption is in June. And that's the end of my presentation, and I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Mark, I want to thank you. Uh, I know that it was the board that asked you and Dr. Marty to take a very close look at this. It was appropriate since you're starting. Uh, this was the time to really look into it and make sure that we're on strong footing and, and that we'll make sure that we're going to be financially good for the future. I'm glad we did it because I feel too that uh, we're in the driver's seat. If we waited two more years, uh, I think it would have been a real disaster for everybody and we'd be making decisions that, uh, you know, that we'd have to make, but they'd be horrible. This way we're able to look at it more calmly and, and make good decisions. Um, I'll let the rest of the board, if you have questions, for. we'll start with Helen. Okay. Um, just, uh, uh, by the way, thank you. This is so clear, and I appreciate that, because um, in the past, well, I'm not going to go there. Um, but anyway, this is, uh, it's so concise and so clear to the stockholders of our district and to the taxpayers as to what we are trying to do. Um, but I did want to ask a question regarding the buses, just to pull something out here that I read, and I need clarification. Um, the Transportation Department will be requesting budget funds of, um, I believe, close to eight, eight, 810000 to cover the purchase for the fiscal year 2012 to 2013. This amount is calculated with Parkway trading 10 buses and keeping two contingency buses to ensure that uh, uh, we meet the transportation commitments associated with the North Area Boundary Line changes beginning next year. So when you say it's going to require 12 new buses, uh, what is the difference between trading the 10 buses and keeping two contingencies? How is that? We, we would normally buy 12 buses and trade in 12 to mm -hmm. keep us on our replacement schedule. Mm -hmm. But because we are changing boundary lines in the North Area, um, we're able to actually keep two of our 10-year-old buses uh, for a year just to see, just to ensure that we're not going to get surprised with, you know, the, the need to add an additional route or two. Um, it's, it's kind of a precautionary measure. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, well, the trade-ins on these buses, if I'm not mistaken, are what, $7,500 a piece? I don't see Will, but I believe, it, I believe it's basically, it would, you know, we'll lose $15,000 on trade on these buses, which again, we can trade them the next year if they're not needed. So we're actually talking 10 instead of 12 new, 10 new buses? Well, no, we're buying 10, but we're only trade, we're buying 12, but we're only trading in 10. Got it, okay. That's so we're adding two to our fleet for this next year, just as a precautionary measure. Got it, thanks, Mark. Other questions? Okay. Mark, on the page about the high school staffing, um, I guess I'm not sure what some of the, this is instructional staffing, is that correct? Yes, it, it is. Um, the, the additional people that you have, can you explain to me what block scheduling means? Does that mean that we have to have extra teachers to accommodate block scheduling? Yes. Okay. And then the, um, the building manager. The is build that an instructional person? You know, I, I always thought they weren't, but they were included in our, our pool. It's not instructional. Okay. Okay. They, so does so that really belong in that ratio it, it then? It probably does not on that one. I. <coughs> um, and then there was one more. The A plus coordinator, is that an instructional person as well? I think so. Yes, the instructional. She, uh, the A plus coordinator would be an instructional person. It's, uh, and it's a point five, so it 
kind of looks like it's a full person there, but this is Right. No, I knew that was a point five. I just didn't know that that person is instructional. instructional. Yeah, okay. It's a certified um, instructor. And what's program preservation? Yes, please. <laughs> the program preservation was uh, was some staffing points as enrollment dipped in some schools mm -hmm. and some different areas. Oh. Really, it's an idea to save programs uh, when enrollment is okay. changing. I understand. So. Thank you. Other questions? Um, with with our new mission and vision. Are we looking at achievement, at student achievement, when we're talking about these positions? Are we, are we looking that they are producing results over all areas of our, all the programs? You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, I mean <laughs> the answer is yes. I'm sorry, yeah. it's not a well-formed <laughs> question. Are, Dee, are you talking about as the ad hoc committee does some of their well, work? Well, and as we move along with this. With the, um, I think so, and I think we're doing what we kind of model what, we're, what our schools are doing with students. It's almost a, a progress monitoring intervention type good. model as far as budget goes. You want to look at the, one of the issues we, we have in doing that is um, we've we've seen some really nice increases in our achievement, mm -hmm. and we want to continue that goal. But it, it's been hard to pinpoint exactly which sure. initiative has. So I think what we're we're trying to think a little differently about some of the resources we're allocating and where we're allocating those, and then also um, um, when to cautiously pull back and reorganize um, and maybe kind of redeploy some positions. Okay, well. just so that is entering into <coughs> some of the decisions. I think as board members will want to know that, right? Um. I think we've got goal one all over it when we're, when we're talking about it. <laughs> Thank I, I, you. I'm actually very proud to say it. Our ad hoc, uh, and, and actually uh, Mr. Kirchhofer is one of the people that I think has raised the question about some of our decisions. Uh, we have many final decisions, obviously, but we've talked about areas where perhaps the data would suggest that we d it's time we talk about some of our uh, our programs and, and how we've been staffing or things. There might be things on paper that look like it might be an easy cut, but if we actually look at the achievement data, do we need to keep that, you know? And, and this is, I mean, although it's never, there's never a good time to, to have budget issues, right. um, the reality is we implemented a lot of these programs over the last three or four years, right. and it's really time that we do, you know, some thorough evaluation of, of everything we've implemented to see whether it's working well, what's working and what isn't, and mm -hmm. can we reorganize and restructure to potentially do it better or, or you know, more efficiently. Well, I've said before, I wish we could see on everything that is brought in front of the board, is it meeting our mission? Is it, you know, I, we're not there yet, but I wish, I wish that would make things much easier for us. Um. I, I just will say that, and, and Mark had talked about the establishment of the ad hoc group. Uh, that's really the first uh, part of our work. It's really, uh, as you know, we don't have a lot of time in sure. preparing for 12-13, so we'll do our best mm -hmm. to answer that. But truthfully, the long-term uh, goal six, which talks about efficiency and effectiveness, mm -hmm. will certainly have much more deeper study uh, into parts organization, and so I, I think we'll be better at it as we go on sure. than, than perhaps we will be with recommendations right now, although we certainly want to be as fair as we can on the recommendations we bring forth in January. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to you too. Uh, well, in many of these areas, and what what you'll come back with, uh, I think one of the things that will be very interesting too is I call it BYOT, bring your own technology. When we can, that could be an area where we might be able to save quite a bit of money for the district if if we're set up so that we can accommodate the technology that students might have, and it'll be quite quite varied, I'm sure. But that that could. Because we spent, we're, we're right now we're looking at spending a lot of money on computers for various people, and maybe that's only at the high school level. I don't know, but yeah. I think you'll be very pleased with the proposal that comes forward on the infrastructure improvements, because it re really will put us in a in a much better position to be able to handle those types of things. Because that's going to be one of the challenges as we move forward and try to use the buildings better, rather than you know when we try to spend our bond money is you know trying to figure out how can we teach the, uh, kids the best. And you know, we, you know, we may be getting better, but we really want to make some big leaps. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Major. <laughs> I'd, I'd just like to, to leverage off your comment regarding 
uh, big leaps. I think this, if, if you look at the, the long-term revenue projections, and I'm not talking two years out, ten years out, uh, you know, as, as a public school system, uh, we, we've got to look at a lot of things different. And that's going to be compelled by the, the budgetary realities. We look at the, the state legislature and, uh, and roughly 40% of the money they spend is in education. And we know exactly how much of it gets spent in Parkway. So that's 5 or 6% of our budget. Uh, and I guess I shared earlier, but there is some good news in the revenue mark. Uh, my 15-year-old Acura doubled in value according to the assessor. So there's an extra 300 bucks in the kitty for you. You're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> we do appreciate it. You know, uh, Ray McNulty, who we had here as a speaker, I, I think said many times when asked questions that uh, just plan on a not, not a lot more money. And I think that's perfect, Mr. Majors, that we, we really do have responsibility. We may see some increases in revenue, but probably not the historic kinds of funding increases we've seen in the past. So we're going to have to look at things differently. Okay, that's a great start. Uh, I know you guys have been on it for a few months now and have uh, a lot of people uh, working on it. And we appreciate that work and know that we're going to be better off. And uh, we, we just want to let you know we appreciate what you and the many people on those committees are doing to try to help us uh, get ourselves where we need to be financially. Thank you. Fourteen point zero policy review. I know this is going to change one of these months, but this <laughs> month there is there are none. So, so there's probably going to be a lot coming here pretty soon. 15.0, call for a special meeting, none. 16.0, call for executive session, January 11th, 2011. That's probably 2012. Thank you. If I may have a motion and a second that the Board of Education call for an executive session, including any record or vote, on Wednesday, January 11th, 2012, at 6.30 p.m. and or immediately following the regular meeting at Central Middle School for the purpose of considering one, legal actions, causes of action, or litigation involving the district, and any confidential or privileged communication between the district or its representatives and its attorneys, 610.021.1, two, hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting of particular employees by the district when personal information about the employees discussed or recorded, 610.021.3, and three, individually identifiable personnel records, performance ratings, and records pertaining to employees or applicants for employment, 610.021.13. So moved. Second. I waited. Roll call. Uh. Mr. Applebaum? Yes. Mr. Steele? Yes. Mr. Spellman? Yes. Mr. Major? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Dr. Scurvey? Yes. Mr. Jacob? Yes. And if I may have a motion and a second to adjourn this regular meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Now it's too late.